All right. Well, our text this morning is relatively brief. The Tenth Commandment, and again, let me just say by way of um, apologetic, as it were, for the commandments, that um, Christ didn't do away with them. He didn't, um, you know, faith in Christ has not replaced obedience to the commandments. We need to understand the commandment was never given in order to earn life, but rather it was meant to show us we needed it. We needed a change of heart so we could obey the commandments. Christ is the one who gives us that change of heart and the blessing of the new covenant, of course, is having that law written on our hearts so that we would desire to do these things. So again, this is the law of love. It's the standard of love. It's um, the household rules for uh, the children of God. This, this is how we are to love the Lord. And how do we know that? Well, because Jesus loved the Lord in this way. He kept these commandments in, you know, to honor his Father and to earn a perfect righteousness for us so that we would be acceptable to him. All right, so the 10th commandment, Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Okay, so the commandment is don't covet but rather be content. Well, again, just by way of review, remember we've been looking at why we should love God. Well, we should love God because he's infinitely beautiful, right? But we should also love him because of all that he has done for us. And we can't review all that, but, but we know that's true. And we've been looking at how we should love him. Now, this morning, as I mentioned, we're coming to the end of the Ten Commandments, so this is the last look that we're going to have for a while at how we are to love the Lord. And uh, we want to look at the shape that this love is to take, right? Now, we are to love the Father, I've already mentioned, as Jesus did. And so here, here are a few summaries of the things that we've seen. And again, think about, if you've been here, whether you remember these things, whether you're making progress in these things, because this is what it means to love God. So again, how did Jesus do it? Well, Jesus put the Father first in his heart. He loved him most of all, and he devoted himself to his Father. Okay, that's where our hearts need to be. And of course, he gave himself to worship him and to serve him, not just on the Sabbath, but every day of his life, his whole life was worship to the Lord. He kept the promises that he made to him. Okay, um, you know, you think about what, what promises did Jesus make? Well, we, we do know he was involved in the eternal counsels of God and what we call the covenant of redemption. His promise to the Father to come into this world as one of us and to do everything necessary to save us, and that included perfect obedience, and then laying down his life on the cross. Uh, Jesus kept those promises to his Father. And, of course, he was also careful to spend time with his Father, not just the Sabbaths, as I've already said, but his whole life. Okay? And again, this is what we are to do, putting the Lord first, devoting ourselves to him in worship, keeping our promises to him, and making sure that we not only give the Sabbath to him, the Lord's day, the first day of the week, to worship him, but to walk with him, every day, all day. You know, we were looking through some old books uh, just last night, and one of the books we came across was Brother Lawrence, you know, practicing the presence of God. And here's a monk who understood what the Christian life was about. He may have thought it in terms of legalistically, and we, don't, we want to avoid that. But the idea is that God is with us. You know, we are to be walking with Him throughout the day and not just meeting with Him for an hour on a Sunday morning. Now, we know that this love we have for God is also to extend to those who are made in the image of God, and that's why we're also, the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But when we do that, we're still loving God. And we, did, we are to do that by honoring those to whom God has given authority, and that means giving weight to what they say, and if it falls within their authority, you know, under the... Under that rubric of their authority, we are to listen to them. If it, if it contradicts God, we're not to listen to them. Uh, we are to guard life, you know, not, not murder, but protect life. We are to protect purity, you know, not um, uh, 
well, running a brother or sister or anyone else into immorality, but rather trying to preserve their purity in the way that we behave um, and the way we think. We know these, this extends to our thoughts and our desires. We are to protect our neighbor's possessions and their reputations. Again, we are to love our neighbors as Jesus loved his neighbor. It's a very high calling, but that is our calling. But this morning, we're going to consider this, how we are to love them by not being jealous of what they have, but rather being content with what the Lord has given us. So what I want to do is I want to look at this commandment negatively, first of all, in the sense that it is worded negatively, don't do this, right? And then see what it calls us to do positively, but then again to remind us what we have as believers that should satisfy us, okay, which is the Lord. Okay, so first of all, this commandment tells us on its face that we are not to desire what others have. Again, let me read the commandment, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, the word covet maybe is a word we don't use that much anymore, but let me give you a definition of the word covet. It is an inordinate, which means excessive, unreasonable, ungoverned, selfish, lustful desire. It's pretty, pretty strong language, isn't it? Uh, we usually say it means not to be jealous or envious, but I think these other words give us a little fuller description. Um, we are not to have these desires for anything that anyone else has. Now, in this commandment, the Lord gives us a few examples, and some of them we can relate to, and others maybe we can't, but things that they might be tempted to envy in their day. A neighbor's house, for instance. Now, remember, when Moses gave this commandment to the children of Israel, or when the Lord gave it, they didn't have necessarily houses in the way we think of them, but they were living in tents. But some people had better tents than, than others, right? And, um, and yet they also knew what it was like to have a house because they did come out of Egypt. And the, a person's house in Egypt would be better or worse depending upon their rank. I mean, there are even ranks among those within Israel. Well, those who had greater means would have nicer homes and those who had lesser uh, would have, you know, more humble homes. But the point is, you're not to be jealous of what God has given to your neighbor. You're not to, to covet your neighbor's wife, okay? Why would you do that? Well, maybe she's more beautiful than your wife. Uh, think of the classic example of how that can get you into trouble when David saw Bathsheba uh, bathing on the roof. Now remember, it wasn't that David was unmarried. I mean, he had actually several wives, and he should have been content with that. But he saw somebody, other, somebody else's wife, some other man's wife, and he took her, he desired her, and he took her, and he broke this commandment because of her beauty. Maybe it's because of her abilities. Maybe she's a great manager at home, a great cook. Or maybe it was because, you know, that uh, your particular wife might be... Um, one of those that likes to criticize, you know, the, uh, the contentious wife. And your neighbor's wife is, is more patient, more quiet, more gentle and kind, you know. And, and maybe you see something more desirable than her. Well, it was very common, probably mainly because of beauty, for a, a man to covet another man's wife. Or perhaps for a wife to covet another man's or another woman's husband, okay? Well, a neighbor's uh, male or female servant, again, because of appearance or ability, their ox or their donkey. Um, okay, how can we relate to this? Okay, well, an ox was, is a tool, a very advantageous tool, used for plowing, for threshing, for drawing a cart or a wagon. They were used for sacrifice or for food. It was a great blessing to have one. Not everybody had one. A donkey was used for riding or for carrying loads. Now, if your neighbor had one and you didn't have one or his was better than yours, um, you know, you might covet uh, your, your neighbor's animal. But then notice more broadly the commandment says not just these things, but anything that belongs to your neighbor. You are not to be jealous of. You're not to covet. You're not to be envious of. Their property, for instance. Think about the vineyard that Ahab wanted. 
Naboth's vineyard. We talked about that under the false witnesses, you know, and the uh, third commandment. What we didn't talk about was Ahab was so sick over his, his envy, his desire to have that vineyard, that all he could do was throw himself on the bed and sulk around. He refused to eat. And this is what moved uh, Jezebel to plot to do away with Naboth so that Ahab could have that vineyard. You see how coveting led to, to evil. We're not to covet somebody's wealth. You know, I imagine that there were people in Israel who were envious of David and especially Solomon. Uh, the, the wealth that uh, those two men had and, of course, the things that their wealth could provide. There were those who coveted office in Israel. I mean, read, read the account of the book of the, of the kings of Israel and how many times there was a political coup to kill the existing king and, and to take his place. Read the book of Numbers to see how Korah, uh, the Levite, and then Dathan, Abiram, and on, who were Reubenites, how they wanted to be a part of the priesthood. They, they coveted that position. And, of course, we know what happened in, in their case as well. Or how many throughout the history of Israel so desired to be a prophet? Because prophets, you know, they had some measure of respect, particularly in the king's court. And they wanted it so badly that if the Lord didn't call them, they would become a prophet anyway, and they became false prophets. And again, just wanting that prestige, that, that favor you would get for the king, especially in prophesying something favorable for the king. Or again, talents. How many of David's military might have uh, been jealous of the 30 mighty men? I used to read that growing up and thinking, wouldn't it be great, you know, to be one of those guys, uh, to have that kind of strength? Or maybe as they heard David composing psalms or they heard Solomon's wisdom, they might have wanted that for themselves. And certainly we know that we can covet somebody else's appearance. Um, you know, beauty is something that has always had a premium, you know, throughout the history of the world. And it can run people into trouble. You know, there's a very interesting passage in Genesis chapter 6 that I think we oftentimes misunderstand what it's actually talking about, where the sons of God see the daughters of men and so forth. And um, the sons of God were the godly line of, of Seth, at least godly in the sense that God was dealing with them, kind of like he dealt with Abraham and his, and his offspring. doesn't mean they're all saved, but it does mean God's dealing with them. But then they see the daughters of men. And these are not just human beings, not like these are angels who see human beings, but these, this is the line of Seth that sees beautiful women in the ungodly line of Cain, and they took them as wives. And mighty men were, were born to them, men of renown, but we know what happened because of that, because of the danger of of God's, you know, godly line being extinguished through these things. Uh, he brought a worldwide flood and destroyed all of mankind except for Noah and his, his sons and their wives and children. Well, there were many things that one could covet in their day. Coveting is not something we have a corner on, but we have many things in our own day. And just think about that. I'm sure you already have as I was going through this list, right? Uh, which of us hasn't been tempted by our neighbor's larger or newer house, their faster or mo more luxurious car? Again, you know, depending upon who your friends are, you might, as, a, as a <laughs> somebody who's in their early 20s, seeing a friend who has a Porsche Turbo Carrera, that can create some difficulties, right? Or maybe you see someone who has a more handsome uh, husband or a more beautiful wife, or maybe their garage is stocked with all these tools that, that can make life easier. Or maybe they just have a lot more wealth. And because of that, they're able to, to um, have nicer things and take more extravagant vacations. You know, maybe earlier on in life, maybe you had parents. I, I had uh, a mother who wanted me to be president, you know. And there are some people who, who think that, you know, if they steer their kids in that direction and get them to be thinking about how much they would like to have that, they might actually obtain it. And some people do covet office, senator, governor, president. Or what about the talents that God has given to other people? Now, recently, Don and I had a chance to hear Tommy Emanuel in concert. If there's anything that made me want to throw that thing away, you know, it was, it was him. Because, I mean, I'm just like... ABCs next to him. Uh, he can play so well. Or those who can play sports. You know, I, 
Uh, funny, the example I have here is Eric Little. Okay. He won, was it 19, was it 1926 or 29, I forget, in, in the Olympics. Okay. Great runner, the movie Chariots of Fire, about his, his testimony, but he, he was a sprinter, he played rugby, he got into uh, running, uh, he was faster than everyone else, and he used that ability that he had as attention was drawn to him. He would use it to draw attention to the Lord, and that's really how we ought to use any, any abilities that God gives to us. But, you know, he was fast, and I ran at one time. It would be nice to be fast like that. Um, we might envy people for their beauty, their accomplishments, their intelligence, uh, God has certainly gifted the church with certain individuals in, in its history who had tremendous minds. We have the, the blessing of being able to stand on their shoulders now, and that's a wonderful blessing, but, I mean, who wouldn't want to have been equipped with that kind of a mind? I'm thinking of men like Augustine or Aquinas or Calvin or my favorite, you know, Jonathan Edwards. Or maybe the ability to evangelize to have that kind of zeal and, and that kind of vocal power to command that attention. And who do you think of when I talk about that? But George Whitfield, or maybe Charles Spurgeon. You know, people came to see both of these men because of their great oratory skills. And of course, the Apostle Paul, who almost by himself evangelized the entire Roman Empire. Or people who had zeal for missions. Now, I'm, I'm thinking about within the household of faith, things we might covet, right? David Brainerd, missionary to the American Indians. Hudson Taylor, a missionary to China. William Carey to India. And you know, Eric Little, after he won, I think, several golds in, in the Olympics, then went on to the mission field and died in a Japanese internment camp you know, while he was ministering to the Chinese during World War II. Or maybe those who had a heart of compassion, who, who were able to give up everything they had so that they uh, could just see the Lord work marvelously in their lives as they ministered to other people. And I think of George Muller, who um, really gave up everything to minister to orphans. And he saw just so many miraculous things. Well, there are plenty of people in the history of the church that we might be envious of. Now, there's nothing wrong with admiring those gifts and appreciating those gifts and the things that the Lord has done through them or even wanting to be used by the Lord as maybe he used them. The problem comes when we become jealous or envious of them. Okay? We are not to covet anything that belongs to them. Paul actually tells us that it's idolatry, and it only leads to sin. So not only are we not to, to covet, okay, but the Lord wants us actually to be thankful for what the Lord has given these other individuals. So if I look at Jonathan Edwards, and I highly appreciate Jonathan Edwards, if I got angry at him, if I hated him because he's far more intelligent than I am, see, that's wrong. But if I look at him, I say, you know what? God has really blessed this man with tremendous intellect, and I can learn from him. You know, that, that's the right kind of an attitude to have. The Lord wants us to be thankful that he has gifted people in these ways. We need to be thankful that he's given our neighbor, our brother or sister, better gifts, better talents than he gives to us and to appreciate them. And yet the Lord even tells us that even if they haven't been given greater gifts, that we are to try to outdo each other in showing honor to one another, honoring them for who they are and what they've done, draw attention to them and not to ourselves. Now that's one part of what it means, of course, to, to love our neighbor, is you know, not hate them because they have something better than we do, but really to be thankful that God has blessed them with those things, those, those good things, okay? But as I told you, there's another side to this commandment, and it is this, that we need to be content with what the Lord has given to us, okay? We need to be happy, we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful that he has, you know, for how he's made us. And that includes, first of all, the gender that he has assigned to us, okay? He made us a man or he made us a woman. And we need to be content with that. It wasn't an accident, right? It was a part of his plan. And not to accept that is to dishonor him, to try and change that. 
is really to pervert his purpose for us. And some would say it is to deny the image of God because you're destroying what you have of the image of God, trying to make it something that it isn't. And nobody can truly transition. But the point is they shouldn't desire to do that. It's a sin to do that. It mars the image of God in man. So it's God who tells us and makes us what we are. And we need to be happy with that and content with that. And actually, actually, that's the only way we're going to be content. He gave us the appearance that he wanted us to have, the appearance that pleased him. And that, of course, should please us. And if we're married, we need to be thankful our spouse found our appearance pleasing and that we found their appearance pleasing. Donna and I discovered uh, years ago, interestingly, that if it's in God's will for you to get married, if you're not married, um, he has somebody for you, somebody that corresponds to you. I had this professor in, in a, um, was it um, church history class? Okay, no, it wasn't church history. It was, it was missions, okay? He was a missions professor. And when I first saw him, I thought, okay, this guy looks like he's probably pushing retirement. You know, he um, looks like he was probably in his late 60s. Turned out he was in his mid-40s, okay? But he had hearing aids and gray hair, and, and you know, he, he was kind of emaciated. And, and um, anyway, so I had, I had this Im impression of him. Then I heard that, that he was engaged, and I was thinking, who would, you know, it would be interesting to see the person who is engaged to this man because he was a, a very, I would say, he was a, a unique individual, okay? So Don and I had a chance to see on one occasion who it was, and this woman he was engaged to looked like the mirror image of him. And we were just thinking, we just kind of laughed, and we thought, you know what? The Lord has someone for everyone. And the thing is, we all tend to love what we look like, and we look for something like that in someone else. You know, you probably heard that before. But I, in, in his case, it was true. But again, God made us the way that he did, and he had a purpose behind it, and you could clearly see it in the match that he had made between these two and really among all of us who have spouses. He's the one who gave us our gifts and our abilities and our talents. And they may not be as great as the ones that he's given someone else, but he has given us the ones that please him. And we are to take those gifts that he's given to us because we, they are unique in many ways. And we are to use them for his glory. Remember what Paul says to the Corinthians when he refers to the body of Christ as, as a body and how the body is made up of several different parts. He said that if we should be a hand, if we should be a foot and maybe not a mouth or you know, an eye or something like that, we're still a part of the body. And we are as absolutely necessary for the Lord's work as any part of the body. So we simply need to recognize those gifts and use them for the Lord's glory. I mean, God placed us in the families that he wanted us to be born into. Uh, I'm sure you had this maybe same experience that I had growing up, but when you reach the age where you say, hey, you know, my parents don't have a lot, but there's these other families that do, especially as you see that on television, rich families, royal families. Hey, wouldn't it have been nice to have been born into a royal family or to be born into a wealthy family? But you know, if that had happened, humanly speaking, we might never have come to know the Lord, right? The Lord put us in the family that he put us in in order that we might come to know him, that we might have need. It's not good to have everything. See what happens to people who have everything? That's not good. That's one of the reasons why the Lord doesn't give us everything. God knows what he's doing. We need to trust him. We need to learn to be content. He gave us our spouse, our children, our vocation, our house, our possessions, the ability to do what we've done. And really, he has a plan for all of that, doesn't he? It was his plan to bring us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to use all that he has given us for his glory. So again, he gave us what he did because it was pleasing to him and because he knew it was what we needed to become what he wanted us to become. Now, the last point and the main reason why we should be content is this, okay? It's because we have him. Okay? We have something far more precious than the world has, regardless of, of who it is you might admire in the world, if it's 
Tommy Emmanuel, or whatever it may be, we have something far more precious than Tommy Emmanuel. We have something far more precious than the richest and most famous people in the world. If we are believers here this morning, we have Christ, we have God, we have the world to come. They are real, okay? And we, we believe that if we're Christians, but we really do need to uh, appropriate that. And for this last point, I just want to point us back to Psalm 73. Remember what we read in Psalm 73? Because the psalmist there was having very much the same struggle that we have with envy, right? He was jealous of the wicked. You know, they were prosperous. Uh, the word fat, by the way, didn't mean they were, you know, morbidly obese, but what it meant was that they, they were healthy and strong and they had plenty to eat, but the psalmist was probably rather lean because he didn't have as much. But he records his struggle as he sees their prosperity. And especially in light of how difficult things were going for him. I mean, he was <laughs> trying to do what was pleasing to the Lord, and they're wicked. They're prospering, and, and he's struggling, chastened every morning. You know, he was experiencing the Lord's discipline. You know, the school of hard knocks. The way that God actually causes us to grow in grace, which isn't by giving us lavish lives and, and lots of riches and fun things to do in the world, but it's actually through suffering that the Lord causes us to grow. And his, as he didn't understand that, he almost stumbled. You know, think about, again, the health and wealth movement and the message that's being proclaimed, which is God wants you to be rich. Well, think about the people who don't get those riches because maybe they actually do belong to the Lord and they have this crisis of faith because they think riches are the sign of God's pleasure. But that's not the case. And the psalmist learned that. When he came into the Lord's house, um, he became thankful and he became content with his situation. First of all, by seeing what was going to happen to them in the end. The end of the road. Verses 18 through 20, surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction, how they are destroyed in a moment. By the way, that passage, Jonathan Edwards has a very powerful sermon on that, uh, what's included in those words. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors, like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. So he saw... Okay, they might, might, things might be going well for them now, but at the end of the road, they're going to slip and fall, and they're going to be destroyed, and there's going to be no hope for them. But then he also saw his future, okay? The reward of the righteous, and that was not riches in this world, not possessions, nice houses and cars, but the Lord, the Lord himself, which is, he is infinitely more precious and beautiful and valuable than anything. He says in verses 23 and 24, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. And as he realized that he had the Lord, he saw that what he had was more than enough to be content. So think of these verses and think about whether... This is true of you, okay? Because this is what needs to be true of all of us as believers. He says this, Whom have I in heaven but you? You know how many people want to go to heaven because they think fishing is better up there? You know, um, they just think about everything in the world here that they enjoy and they think it's going on up there and they want to go there because, okay, I can actually win this time. Or maybe they have a loved one up there. And I think many of us do. And it would be wonderful to see them again. But... That's not the main reason why we should want to go. Whom have I in heaven but you? Why would you want to go to heaven? What is the, the, the reason you should have and I should have? Is that the Lord is there, the one that we love the most. And then he says this, And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. Wow. If I have him, I can be content. I have everything that I need. Um, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This is what it means to love him most of all. And that's really what he calls us to do, isn't it? That's the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment in scriptures, Lord? The greatest commandment is, hear, O Israel, the Lord is, you know, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one Lord, 
and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. You know, Jonathan Edwards wrote this, and this is a paraphrase. He says, God knows how worthless the earthly riches are, the things of this world. And that's why he more often, not exclusively, more often, gives them to the wicked because they are not the true riches. So that being the case, far from being an indication of his favor, as again, health and wealth gurus say, they're really more often that of his displeasure, you know, if you don't love the Lord. Okay? The real mark of his favor is really giving us the opportunity to suffer in his place. That was something that Paul gloried in. And, you know, when you can actually glory in something like that, if you actually desire to suffer for the Lord, um, that makes it easy then to do whatever he calls you to do because you're no longer afraid of what man might do to you. We all need to have that kind of heart. We have so much more than the world has. We have the true riches in Christ. We have forgiveness. We're not going to suffer forever in a fiery hell. We, we have acceptance by God. We have adoption into His family. We have an eternal inheritance, not just heaven in the intermediate state, which is, that'd be great just by itself, but the new heavens and the new earth where everything is made new and perfect again. And that is why we can be content. Again, Jonathan Edwards reminds us of another important truth. If that is the case, okay, if those are the true riches, then he says it really doesn't matter who prospers here below. Doesn't matter who prospers here. The only thing that matters is who is going to prosper in the eternal state. And why do you say that? Because how long are you going to be here? Right? 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. Some people make it over 100, maybe even 110. I can't say the quality of life is great, but they might survive that long, okay? But how long are you going to be in the eternal state? A lot longer than down here. So it doesn't matter if things are hard here. If you have the Lord, you have enough. But if you are suffering for him here, you are storing up treasures in heaven where you get to keep them forever. And those treasures are, what, not, not a larger mansion, you know, not, not the streets of gold, that type of thing, because those are really symbols, and, and they wouldn't mean that much anyway. But rather, it is the ability to enjoy God and perhaps places of honor in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that is a reality. Those things that the Lord has given to us, they are real. And that's why Paul could be content even when he was in prison. You know what I, um, I guess I haven't read this passage yet, but in the book of Philippians, when he, uh, what he writes here, he wrote from prison, okay? And Roman prisons weren't the best places in the world to be. You know, you could think of nicer places you might want to be. It wasn't the worst you could be either. But he says this, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. And I also know how to live in prosperity. Well, that, that's the harder part. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Well, what was that secret, Paul? He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He found contentment in the Lord, and he knew that having the Lord, he had everything that he needed, as the author to the Hebrews also reminds us. The Lord has told us, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. We can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? If we have him, we have everything we need, and that's why we should be content. It's because we have everything we need, and God has promised to give us everything we need in this life as we prepare for the life to come. Well, may the Lord help us to believe that and, and to act upon that and to live in this way, to desire nothing on earth but Him and to look forward to Him in, in heaven. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer as we prepare uh, to come to the table now.